Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, like I just said, I'm Hudson Busby, Solutions Architect at Quack. I've been working in the big data space uh, for the majority of my engineering career and excited to show you guys today a little bit about what Quack does and how you guys can interact with Quack and Snowflake to build end-to-end -end machine learning models. So um, just a little bit of an overview. We'll get started today with the presentation. Um, feel free to send questions into the chat. We have a few people on the team that can probably answer those questions immediately. I'll take a pause right before the demo and answer a few questions. We'll go through the after the presentation and the demo, and then we'll take a, another pause and do some more questions for you guys. So uh, excited to get started here. So a quick agenda for the call. Um, we're going to go over a brief overview of kind of the current state of MLOps and some of the problems that many teams face in building machine learning pipelines. We'll discuss a little bit about what Quack does and the problems that we're trying to solve. We'll then go into what a feature store is and if a feature store would be right for your environment. We will then build a feature ingestion pipeline, pulling data directly from your Snowflake source into the Quack feature store. We'll create a data source. We'll create that ingestion pipeline. And then we're going to actually build the machine learning model connecting directly to that feature store, pulling the feature data out for training and prediction. And then after that, after we build that machine learning model, we'll deploy it as an endpoint, and then we can test it to see it actually working live. Okay, let's get started. So a little bit about Quack. Quack, um, our mission is to simplify the machine learning process by providing a platform that is an end-to-end -end machine learning environment. So all of your training, all of your deployment, um, all of your feature store, your testing, all in one platform in one place, no need to stitch together several different services or products. We have about 50 customers in production, hosting around 5 billion predictions a day. Um, some of our customers include Notion, OpenWeb, Superbet. Um, and one thing that we're really proud to say is that 100% of our customers have been able to take a machine learning model from development and put it into production, um, many of those in the POC process. We were founded in 2020. Um, our office was headquartered in Tel Aviv, but we have offices in New York, as you can see here today, um, San Francisco, Tel Aviv, Warsaw. So this graphic, I think, really visually represents the challenge that many teams face in deploying and putting into production a machine learning pipeline, machine learning environment. There are many different services, products, internal teams, external products that you need to stitch together in order to take a machine learning project or data science project from inception to actual use in your APIs or your services or so that your customers and users can actually interact with them. Let's say that for development purposes, you guys are a notebook shop. Maybe you use um, Databricks or Hex to actually construct the logic of your models. From there, you actually need to build the models. You need to train those models. So you'll need another tool, maybe something like MLflow to host the infrastructure required for training, to keep track of those builds in somewhat of a logical place so that you can you know, iteratively see the changes over time. You can roll back if you need to. You need some type of a versioning system, some type of a registry to keep track of those models over time. Okay, now that your models have been trained and built, we need to actually deploy those models into production so that your users and your APIs can actually interact with them. That's going to require, maybe you're using SageMaker for uh, deployment. Maybe you have internal teams that are capable of deploying those tools. Again, more infrastructure, more teams. Um, now you have models in place. Maybe we have a, a team of machine learning and engineers or data scientists and all of those machine learning models in production share a lot of the same input data. Um, you're creating the same features for all of those data. You're running multiple ingestion pipelines to get that data into your machine learning models. So now we introduce the concept of a feature store so that we can try to collaboratively share those features across models or a feature registry. Um, maybe once our models are in production, we actually have to keep track of the resources required to run those models. We need to make sure that our CPU, our memory, or GPU are in the right places or not getting maxed out. So we need a monitoring tool, an alerting tool. Okay, now we're getting more advanced. Um, we want to have trainings executed on some kind of a cadence. We want to have a scheduling orchestration tool like an airflow that would actually run our models every single morning. Um, you can quickly see how this 
kind of web or this service layer um, gets extremely complicated very quickly. It's not an easy process to just take a business use case that can be solved by machine learning or data science and actually put that into production. Um, for the most part, I think data scientists are really focused on the logic of their model and coming up with that solution, the all of the complexity, the math, the logic, and they're not as worried or concerned about the infrastructure required to put that into production. So that's what we're trying to solve here um, by creating an all-in-one MLOps platform where you can take all of these different services, all of these deployment requirements, put them into one place. We have a managed notebook pro uh, product called Workspaces, which you'll see shortly. So you can develop your model logic directly in the Quok platform, and you can share those notebooks collaboratively across members of your team. After development, we have a model registry and a model build training process. So you can execute the training of your, your models all within the Quok platform. We have a registry so you can keep track of builds. You can easily compare builds so that you can see what changes were made, what um, metrics like F1 score accuracy were improved by a latest release of a, a model. After building and training, we have a really simple deployment process, which you'll see in the demo that can be as simple as one click. You have a model build and we're putting it into production so that our users can actually interact with it. We have a ton of functionality around model serving so that you can host multiple models at the same time. You can split traffic to different models. Um, really intelligent, functional programming that allows you to have dynamic applications in production. We also host a feature store. So you can collaboratively share those features across your machine learning models. We have feature ingestion pipelines, that, which you'll see in the demo today, that will take data from your source and store them into both an offline and an online source, you can use those feature data in model training as well as model prediction. We also have um, out of box, we have model monitoring, which you'll also see in the demo where you can see uh, latency, CPU, GPU limits. Um, there's also a great graphic and visualization of error handling and auto scaling capabilities built around that. And lastly, we have a vector store, which we're releasing in the next week. So if you have complex uh, embeddings that are required with your model, or if you're hosting large language models, you can store all of that data in the vector store and very easily query um, and query on different parameters as well that you attach to that data. So a little bit about how Quok and Snowflake interact together, because we're going to be building a Quok machine learning model on top of your Snowflake data here today. So first and foremost, all of your data still remains in Snowflake. We're not trying to you know, replace your data lake here or even replace the ETL processes or your data engineering teams that are putting all of that data into Snowflake and transforming them. Quok is a manager of the machine learning infrastructure required to take a model from development to production. So again, we manage the infrastructure for building, for training, for deployment, as well as alerting, auto-scaling. But when it comes to the separation between your data and the actual machine learning models themselves, your data stays in Snowflake. We just help with the machine learning and the building side of things. Okay, so um, I've spoken a little bit about uh, the feature store. So you might be wondering kind of like, what are some of the benefits of a feature store? So the first, like I, I mentioned a little bit earlier is that feature collaboration. Um, it's really likely that as your machine learning team grows and becomes more evolved, you're likely reusing the same features across all of your machine learning models, or at least some of them. Um, and what's required to get that data from your Snowflake table into the machine learning model itself is some form of an ingestion pipeline. So a feature store provides many benefits. One of them is that you can ingest it in one simple pipeline and store it in a single location versus many different pipelines or each individual pipeline pulling their data. And you know, you're not keeping track of how those features are actually used across your model. Um, second is training serving skew. So this is a problem that emerges, I think, with models as they get into a little bit more of a maturity stage and you've been running machine learning model for a while. Let's say you have a user recommendation engine and, you know, that takes a look at the most recent user data and provides a prediction for an ad or for some type of user behavior. When we're hosting that prediction, we want to be using 
data for that user that's the most recent, that's the most relevant data. We don't want to be running the model on training data that was acquired four or five months ago because maybe that user's activity has drastically changed. So this is something that the feature store solves by having both an offline and an online store. All of your data, all of your feature and feature data is ingested into both locations. The offline store can be a great tool for building and training your machine learning models. You can use um, like more of like a bulk data ingest. Um, and then the online store can be used for quick recalls. So when you're hosting predictions or you're hosting inference, you can get that fresh feature data and make sure that the user activity data is the most recent and you're giving the best predictions. And lastly, um, source of truth. I think it's pretty common in the big data world now to have some form of a governance tool or some form of a metadata tool that actually keeps track of you know, where these features come from, what their source data set was, um, some type of a lineage so that you can actually keep track of all of this data and have somewhat of an idea of how your machine learning models are pulling from source. So we provide that with a really nice feature registry. You can see um, all of the features that your team has available, as well as which data source they came from and which models are using them. So this is um, a little bit more about the feature ingestion pipeline that you're going to be seeing in the demo here. So like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be pulling data from a Snowflake table, a Snowflake source. We ingest that data into both the online and the offline feature store. From there, we're going to actually build a machine learning model. In the build or the training stage of that machine learning model, we're going to pull from the offline store that bulk data so that we can actually train our model. Then on the hosting or the prediction side of that model, we're going to pull from the online store so we can get that fresh reach and data to make an accurate prediction. And then you'll see a, a number of other things with the models itself, but this is kind of the high level overview of what you'll be seeing in the demo very shortly. Okay, so get ready. We're gonna build an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline for a real-time risk model using Quark and Snowflake. Um, before we go into the demo, I'm gonna take a pause to see if there's any questions. Um, okay, it seems like we don't have any questions yet. Save those for the end, happy to answer, or maybe one to just pop up. Oh, just a recording. Yeah, we will happily send a recording for this meeting. Okay, let's hop over to the Quack platform and we can get started. So welcome to the Quack platform. This is the overview page where you can see kind of high level um, information or metrics about your overall um, machine learning environment, the number of models that you have deployed, automations, which is um, kind of a scheduling tool that we'll get into a little bit later, monitors, as well as all of the features that you have located or stored in your feature store, as well as the different data sources that those features are coming from and just general user activity. So the first thing that we're gonna do today is create a data source. So a data source is a quark object or a quark entity that we use to connect to the source of your data. Today, we're going to be reading from a Snowflake table, so we can take a look at the Snowflake data source. You configure a name for your data source as well as a description, just a little bit of information about the model or the data that we're going to be using today. We have a bunch of user demographic data stored in a Snowflake table, and our model is going to determine if those users are a credit risk or not. So the first thing that you need to configure in the data source is a date created column. So the date created column is effectively an ETL column, an ETL timestamp, some timestamp column that's uh, located in your source table that allows us to do some work on top of. So when you're creating a feature ingestion pipeline, you know, think of it like an airflow DAG or an ETL job. You're pulling data from a source and you're storing it into the feature store. So we need somewhat of a timestamp column so that Quark can automatically configure the windows of time or the windows of data that will be pulling from that source location. So, um, you know, if you're running a job every hour, every day, we'll use this column to create the start and end time of that window. You'll configure a uh, username and secret, or username secret as well as a password secret. Quack has a uh, secret management system, so you can create secrets for 
login information, credentials, and then discreetly use those in your feature ingestion pipelines or your machine learning models or use them as environment variables, et cetera. We'll then specify the schema in Snowflake that we'll be pulling from, the host of your Snowflake deployment, as well as the database, and then the table name. Um, so we can go ahead and test this connection to make sure everything is working properly. Great, and we are connected. Before we start, if you take a look at the right, you'll see the code that's actually generated for this data source using the Quark SDK. So just wanted to point this out at the beginning. Um, we're going to do a lot of building and deployment today using the Quark UI. The Quark UI is a really great way to you know, play around, build models, test things. Um, but all of the functionality that you'll see today is available as infrastructure as code. And I think for the most part, we generally try to push our customers um, to not do everything in the UI at least and define some of their pipelines as infrastructure as code, just because it creates a better engineering environment, um, better engineering practices. So um, I'll try to point the, the code out as we go along today. Okay, so we have our data source configured. We can go ahead and create our feature ingestion pipeline. So the first thing that we select is the Snowflake data source. Um, you'll also see some other data sources here. We have data source connectors for CSVs, S3, object store, um, pretty much any other type of data source, you name it. We're doing Snowflake today. Um, and we're also always happy to build new data source connections if there's something that you don't see here. The second thing that you're going to select is an entity. So an entity is effectively a, it's another quark kind of, um, concept or a quark object, and it's a primary key on the table. What that entity allows us to do is kind of add some additional functionality on top of the ingestion. So for the most part, you're going to want the most recent data in your feature store. By specifying that primary key, it allows us to do deduplication on that window of data that we're ingesting, and it allows us to do aggregations on the data so that we have some kind of a grouping key mechanism. Okay, so we can give this feature set a name. Um, we'll call this user risk webinar pipeline. User risk data from Snowflake. So just give it a name and a description. We'll again select that entity column that I was just, just discussing. And then we'll configure a backfill start date. So this is um, basically, uh, you know, backdating your data. So the first time that this initial ingestion runs, you can specify how much of that source table you want to read. Do you want to read the entire history of the table? Do you want to read up to a certain point? And then after that backfill has completed, the ingestion job is going to just pull the most recent data based on a window that you configured. So I don't remember when this data actually started. So we're going to go back quite far in time here. Okay, great. Um, that should be enough to get us some data for the our presentation today. So then we can go ahead and configure a scheduling policy. So this, again, if you use Airflow, this is just cron, it looks familiar, but this is going to schedule how frequently your feature ingestion pipeline runs. Um, and like I said, the first job will be backfill. It'll be taking the entire source data or however far back you want to go. And then for every subsequent ingestion job after that, we're going to be taking a window. So basically the end time will be the execution time and the start time will be the end of the last run. So we're going to run this pipeline every single day at UTC zero. We can then go ahead and select the columns that we want for our feature store. Um, you can see the data type of those columns, the feature name. Um, we're actually going to show an example of an aggregation. So we also have the ability to add aggregations. So let's say in our source data, you know, we have just going back, it was some demographic data that we're going to use to determine if this user is a credit risk or not. And we also have some numeric data, saving account, checking amount. So we can add an aggregation. Let's say we wanted to take the average checking account amount over the last day as a value. Quark will automatically configure this code for you so that it does the group by mechanism, it adds the aggregation, and you don't need to worry about anything. So we can go ahead and create this feature set. Um, while this feature set is creating, it's basically just scanning the data source, making sure that the connection is valid, making sure that all of the data types match, that you don't run into any errors during runtime. And then we'll see a quick preview of the data that you can see here. Okay, great. So we'll actually go ahead and kick this feature pipeline off. 
And you'll see the code that was generated um, by Quark or run by Quark on the background. So if you were writing you know, all these ingestion pipelines as code, this is kind of what it would look like. Um, yeah, we, you know, same, all the same values, name, user, data source, um, the backfill scheduling. You can also specify the cluster resources of the ingestion. So if you have a really large job that you're ingesting, um, you can, you know, bump the machine or bump the resources up, bump the juice up there and get a really large machine to make sure it can handle all of the data that's coming in. And if you take a look at the SQL that's generated here for you, you'll see we're doing the, we're selecting that user ID. We're taking the average of the checking account and then we're grouping by user ID. So all of the aggregation is done for you, intelligently generated. So this is generated as a Spark SQL transformation. Um, you can also, you can you know, define your own SQL if that's easier. You can also do um, custom transformations or custom UDFs using data frame logic or Python logic, um, also all available. And when you would configure that as code, you'd be able to specify that. Okay, so let's go into the actual, um, so I created a, another feature ingestion pipeline that has been running previously, so that way we can see kind of what this looks like after it's already completed. So this is, again, same feature ingestion um, logic here. So we can see all of the previous ingestion jobs that have run. Um, this one didn't have any new data, but we can see some previous data from the initial ingestion when this was run. So you're able to keep track of all these ingestions over time. You can dig into the job and see the logs that are displayed um, in case you wanted to monitor or take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. So we also have um, the ability. So again, this is a job that's already run. So we actually were able to take data from Snowflake and put it into our online or online and offline feature store. So we provide a querying tool um, directly embedded in the platform. So you can actually see what that feature data looks like live. And you know, this is a really helpful tool just to you want to take a glance at your feature data, make sure that your ingestion worked, that your, your logic was good in your code. Um, and you can also just take a glance at your feature data if you want to see how it's changing over time. Um, we also provide the ability to um, query this in code so that if you wanted to, you know, build out like a testing framework, um, you know, set up an alert to make sure new data gets there, you have the ability to do that with our API clients. We have a distribution tab that just shows you what the user feature data looks like and how it changes over time. This can be really helpful when determining um, feature drift if you have a model that's been running for a long time to make sure that those features are still relevant and make sense in your machine learning model. And we also have the feature lineage tab that just shows you, um, you know, where the data came from, what models it was connected to. This is a pretty simple one because we're just reading from a single table, but these can obviously get more complex over time because the feature ingestion pipeline also allows you to join tables together um, if you need dimensional data or join two feature sets together to create a more complex ingestion. Okay, so just to recap a little bit here, what we did, we can created a data source, we created that connection to Snowflake so that we can read the Snowflake data. We then defined a feature ingestion pipeline that read that Snowflake data and stored it into the Quark online and offline feature store. Um, so now we're actually going to build a machine learning model where we read that feature data from the offline store, train our model, and then read the data from the online store and serve predictions. Also take a glance real quick. This is just what our uh, feature registry looks like. Again, just kind of a nice management data governance tool to have. So you can see a glossary of all of your features, where they came from, uh, the data source when they were created, data types, things like that it can be just helpful when a machine learning or data scientist engineer is getting started and they want to see what's the available data for our organization. Okay, so we're going to head over to the workspaces tab. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, workspaces is our latest feature. It is an, a managed Jupyter notebook service that is embedded directly in the Quark platform. Um, this is meant to be you know, a collaboration tool so you can share notebooks or share code across your team. Um, you can also test out your models beforehand so you can make sure that they're actually running before um, uh, before you launch them into production. And you also can build directly from the workspaces. Um, so you can you can develop in these workspaces, you can deploy and you can build. So they can really um, you know get your model built from development to production kind of in one place. So here we have the machine learning model that we're going to be running today. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of 
code discussion here just to under so we understand what's going on in the background. So the first thing you know we import our pip install or uh, import all of our libraries and dependencies. And then you'll see the actual logic of our model class. So all that's required to run a model on the Quark platform is that you import this Quark model class and wrap your model logic around that Quark model class. Um, the Quark model class has two key functions that are required to, in order to deploy it. The first being the build function. The build function is what is run during the training aspect of your model. So once you've completed your development, you put it on an instance, and you're ready to train, pull that training data in and run the model and um, build it up over time, you'll run this build function. So let's take a step or take a look at what's actually going on in this build function. The first thing we're doing is calling a function called self.fetch features. So if we look above the fetch features function is what's actually calling the offline feature store, retrieving data for our model building, our model training. All you do is create an offline client. You specify the columns from the feature store that you want to retrieve, and then run the API call, return data. The data can be returned as a data frame or JSON. Um, data frames generally tend to be a little bit easier um, when you're already working in them for machine learning models. So that's what we did today. So the first thing, we fetch our feature data from the offline store. Now we have data we can train our model on. We select the columns that we want to um, use as our features. We select our um, outcome variable so we can separate our training data, our validation data. We build the logic of our model. We train it. And then we actually validate that model and print off some metrics. Um, so Quark provides a API for actually logging metrics directly in the model. And this is really nice because it allows you to attach those metrics to the model build registry, which you'll see um, in just a second, um, so that you can compare you know, metrics across different model builds. You can deterministically say, if this F1 score is not above a certain threshold, don't deploy the model into production or roll back to a different version. So there's a lot of functionality that you can do around those metrics. And we encourage customers to you know, log as much as possible so they have a lot of metadata around their models. Okay, so the second kind of core function of the clock model class is the predict function. Um, so the predict function is after your model's been built and trained, this is what's actually interacting with the users to serve those predictions, to so serve those inferences when you're ready to use your model in production. So Quark provides an API decorator where we are basically hosting the server for you. We create the endpoint for you. You don't need to configure any infrastructure um, or any additional code in order to serve this model. We'll handle all of that for you in the back end. All you need to do in your predict function is basically write the code that handles the input data from the request, runs that data through your model, and then returns it to the user. Um, we have a host of different input and output adapters. So we're using data frames today, but you could also specify JSON or protobuf, um, CSVs, and then you can also do the same thing as you're returning data back to the user so that your prediction service fits nicely in your overall um, service mesh or your overall architecture environment. You'll also notice this, um, this attribute of the Quark API decorator, feature extraction equals true. When this is set, Quark will automatically pull the relevant data from the online store. Um, so in this case, we're sending a user ID as the request. Um, you'll see this in just a second once we deploy the model. And Quark is pulling all of the relevant data for that user ID that we'll send in the request from the online feature store, gets the most recent data, and then it runs it through the model to return if this user is a risk or not. And that's really it. There's some other functionality here, but we don't really need to get into that for the most part. Um, it really is as simple as defining this build function for your training and defining this prediction function so we can use this model in an API or in um, a service. So now that we have our model logic configured, we're actually going to deploy this model. So um, I have um, just the Quark CLI installed on this machine so we can run this call and it will it'll make an API call to the Quark platform to build this model. So if we go over to the models tab, um, You'll see a list of the different projects. Um, so the kind of the directory or the structure of Quark is 
projects and models. Projects can kind of be used to maybe separate teams or separate, you know, high level projects. And then within projects, you can have several models. So this is the model that we just deployed. Um, it's a real time endpoint. We have a few different deployment types, batch, real time and streaming, real time meaning that we're hosting an endpoint so you can call it live. And this is our model overview page. Taking a second to load today. We can actually go through, ah, here it is. Uh, so the model overview page shows how your model is performing in production. We can see the throughput, how many requests it's getting per minute. Um, if you're getting a high error percentage, this can be you know, indicative of an unhealthy model or maybe um, you know, resources are getting used too frequently or too much on the machine. You might need to scale um, at an extra instance. Um, the average response time, um, and as well as this feature um, called timers is something that we recently re uh, released. And basically timers allow you to add attributes in your prediction codes. So you can see exactly how long um, each line of code is taking, and then we can break it out for you in kind of a latency graph. This can be nice if you know your model training is taking a really long time or your data transformation is taking a long time. You can see exactly what is causing that spike in latency. So if we go over to the builds tab, we will see the build that we just kicked off is currently building. Um, within the individual view, build view itself, you are presented with the logs of the build. So you can see when we've provisioned or when we've gotten an instance from the cloud provider, the building the model environment, um, installing the Docker image, installing the libraries or the drivers that are required to run the logic of your machine learning model. And then you can see um, as the build function kicks off, you know, um, the actual training logs itself, those metrics that we were talking about earlier will all be presented here. So this is just a really nice way to, you know, I think any engineer would say this is nice so that you can actually figure out what's going wrong when your model builds. You're not stuck in the dark and just, you know, trying to figure it out on your local machine, but not understanding why it's not deploying to production. Within the model view page, you also have the ability to see the model code itself. Um, this is really helpful. Um, I can say firsthand, just when you're deploying a lot of models and you forget exactly what's been deployed, um, you can see it really easily here. You can you know, understand where changes might have been made. You can also see the CPU and utilization and the memory utilization of that specific model build. Um, that way, when you know the model build is taking a really long time, you can understand, okay, maybe we need to increase some resources or fix some code um, in our model itself. So that way we can actually get this thing to run. You'll notice the metrics that are logged um, to the left, those are the same metrics that we included in the build, um, accuracy, F1 score. These are all custom. They can be configured by you and they're tied to a build. So if we go to the overall builds page, we can filter out a few things here. Oh, there it is. Um, we can see how these metrics change or how they're defined across our different builds so that we can really easily compare one build from another. So if we're constantly iterating, or maybe we have, you know, some CICD logic that automatically kicks off a new model build after we've merged to main, we can see those changes um, easily displayed in the platform. And you also notice that um, you, know, you have all of your builds in one place, this registry, it's really easy to roll back. You have a nice glossary of all of your builds over time. So that way you don't have to be scared about pushing to production. This can be a very you know simple, easy process. Um, it doesn't have to be concerning. Okay, so now that we have our model built, we're actually gonna go ahead and deploy this model. Um, when you're deploying the model, you have um, a few different settings. You know, you're able to select the, the instance that you want the deployment to run on, the CPUs, um, the number of workers, if you want replicas, so you want multiple um, pods running. If you have a really large pr uh, prediction service, you need three, four, five, and number of nodes, you're able to specify that here. You're also able to add auto scaling policies. So Quark will automatically auto scale your prediction services for you. You don't need to worry about adding or removing nodes from the cluster. You can set the min number of nodes, the max number of nodes. And you also have the ability to kind of control the logic of auto scaling so that if let's say I want, I want to scale up my prediction service after an error rate of on a code of 400 has been, you know, average of 
15%. So 15% of all of my calls are experiencing an error over a 10 minute period. We could automatically scale that instance up and give you more resources. So your, your, uh, your application isn't starved. Okay, so we can go ahead and deploy this model. Oh, there we go. So while that model is deploying, we can actually go ahead and test another model that we have running. So that's one really great feature of the Quark deployment process is that you can have multiple deployments at the same time. You can This can be really useful. So maybe you wanna A-B test your models um, after you've made a lot of recent new changes. You can divert traffic so that maybe we're only testing, you know, 10% of our requests go to one model, 90% go to another. So that way we can kind of beta test the model to make sure that nothing's breaking before fully releasing to production. You can also geographically separate your requests um, with attributes so that if you have models that are language specific and you want to make sure that all of your user speaking um, requests are filtered to a specific user speak or English speaking, sorry, English speaking model, you can have the ability to do that. So we have another model that's actually deployed currently. So we're going to go ahead and test that. Um, Quark provides a really nice um, examples, configurations that you can easily test your model. We have a REST client as well as a Python, Java, and Go client. So today um, we'll just use this uh, REST client and we can go ahead and select our user ID um, that we'll send to the API. And then we can test this inference live in the platform. Great, and we can see that um, this model is currently working. We sent in a user ID and this user was identified as being a credit risk. No good for them. We can actually go to the analytics tab. So one of the, I think, best features of the Quark platform is that for each prediction or each request that's made to your prediction service, Quark will store the request input as well as the output in the Quark Analytics Lake. So if you know you have a model running in production and you want to make sure that it's working over time, or, or you know, you want to do some kind of QAT testing, you have the ability to really easily see exactly what was sent to your model as well as what the model returned as a output. Um, this data we have an analytics client, so you can query the direct or the lake directly. Um, we can also export this data directly back into your Snowflake environment. You also have the ability to um, write more complex queries here. So if you want kind of a business intelligence environment or business or some kind of like overviews to make sure that your models are performing as expected, you can save these queries and have kind of another workspace to analyze and track your models. We also have monitors and alerts set up um, so that if um, you're, again, going back to CPU or more on the infrastructure resources side, if your CPU spikes or your GPU spikes above a certain threshold, we can automatically send a Slack message to your team to alert them that you might want to change something in your deployment. Um, we have logs available so you can watch as your application is running and um, you know debug or test anything that might come up. And the last thing that we'll talk about today is automations. Um, so automations are basically a, you know, a scheduling orchestration tool. So let's say, um, you know, that helps with your, uh, your CI CD workflows or just scheduling in general. So let's say that we want to schedule our training. We have fresh data as we are ingesting data um, from the feature store on a daily cadence. Let's say that we want to retrain our model after that data has been ingested. We can schedule that, um, that training here using automations. We'll automatically pull the code from GitHub and build that model for you on a cadence that you specify. Um, you could also make this intelligent with GitHub Actions so that if you wanted to kick off an automation after a merge domain has happened or after a new branch has been started, you'd be able to do that. Automations also work for deployments so that you can... Um, specify going back to the metrics that we were talking about earlier if the f1 score is above 70 percent which i think we saw on our model that we built then the deployment would happen if it's below that it wouldn't deploy and your previous service your previous prediction um, model would still remain deployed um, we wouldn't deploy any other new models so you know, a lot of really good engineering habits and structure that you can build with the Quark platform. I think that's one thing that we're, um, you know, 
trying to provide as a service, not only including all of the tools you need to build a machine learning pipeline in one place, but helping you to structure your environments and your codes so that you have best developer practices and that you're building a logical system that is iterative, can be built and maintained and grow over time. And that's something that automations definitely help with. If we go back to our builds tab, we'll see the model that we built in the notebook was deployed. We can go ahead and test this model once more, just to make sure that everything is still working as expected and I didn't break anything um, accidentally in deploying this model today. Great. Um, we got the same value as the previous deployment. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of our demo today. Um, just to recap a little bit about um, what we were covering in this demo. So we started off, we created a data source. We connected the clock platforms to your Snowflake table and configured the authentication. Then we created a feature ingestion pipeline that pulled data from that Snowflake source and stored it in both the online and the offline store in the clock platform. Then we created a machine learning model using workspaces. We pulled data from the offline store for training, and then we also pulled data from the online store for prediction. We used the, the Quok platform to build and train that model and store it in the Quok model registry. Uh, we played around with some monitoring and some analytics and looked at how Quok can give you more insight into the performance of your model. And then we deployed that model and we tested it live so that you could see that it is not only in production, but it is working as expected. Um, and yeah, that's that's our demo for the day. Um, you know, if you're interested in learning more about Quok or you want to try it yourself, um, please visit Quok and get started. We have a lot of demos and tutorials. Um, you can create yourself as a user and really deploy and build a model in about as much time as it took to go through this demo today. It's very intuitive and I highly recommend getting started today. So with that, um, I will go to the questions and see if um, there's anything that I can answer. So actually Hudson, the team has answered most of the questions during the session itself. Um, Wonderful. Maybe you could quickly uh, just uh, review some of them in the answered section. Yeah, sorry, I'm having a, uh, not seeing any questions. Um, there's, a, there's the open tab and then there's the answered tab in the list. So, so the audience should have received all the answers. If you're not seeing them, um, we will obviously share the uh, recording and the, the answers are in the answers pane. Are you able to see them, Hudson? Yeah, I'm having a hard time getting the chat open, but um, we have somebody else here, so I can probably see the questions live. Okay, great. Lots of machines. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, one of the questions that I saw, I think you guys have answered them. Was there another one that um, I wasn't able to answer? No, actually all have been, oh, there are new ones now. Okay, so let, let me read it out. Or, or you, so how, how do you- oh, sorry, I got it, Q&A tab, okay. <laughs> There we go. How do you identify the data drift? I can see the F1 score threshold being set. Is that the only way? Um, basically through the analytics tab and through the query engine that we described earlier, you're able to fully query the offline feature store and keep track of that data over time. So we provide some analytics for you to visually see that, but if you wanted a more scientific or in-depth approach, you could take that analytics client, pull the data into, you know, your local workspace, run some logic on top of that and get your answer. Um, you could also set up, you know, it's a, it's a client. So if you wanted to set up a airflow job that pulled data from the analytics, uh, or sorry, from the offline feature store, pulled that feature data in, um, run some analysis on top of that, and then, you know, kick off an automation that either stops that pipeline or redeploys an earlier version of the pipeline, you could do that as well. Um, what is the maximum size of data Quok can handle to build a model? So um, 
we I think we're able to show um, when you create a deployment, you're able to specify the resources. So we have um, pretty much any instance that's available in the AWS marketplace. You're able to grab that instance and run your model on. So anything that's available in in from the cloud provider, uh, you would be able to use for your model and training. So really up to you in terms of data um, and how you I would say you know is it limitless? You know um, you you obviously can't pull. Um, petabytes of data onto a single machine, but however you structure that code um, or structure your data partitioning would allow you to handle as much data as possible. But yes, anything that's available in terms of the AWS um, instance marketplace, we can deploy on. All right. Great. Thank you, Hudson. Thanks everyone for joining this session. We'll make the recording available shortly. If you have any questions or want to learn more about what we do at Quack, please go to www.quack.com. Again, thanks Hudson. Thank and you. thanks everyone. Do we stop?